Adam. So uh, thank you all very much for joining us today. We're incredibly pleased to be joined by Professor Kwame Anthony Apaya, who's a renowned moral and political philosopher and is currently at the NYU, New York University, whilst previously he was a Lawrence St. Rockefeller University Professor of Philosophy at Princeton University. We're incredibly honoured to be joined by you today, Professor. Thank you very much for your time. I'm very happy to do it. Wonderful. So I'd just like to start off our conversation with the elephant in the room, because uh, African Americans in the US have faced decades, uh, centuries of systemic oppression, and obviously the mode of oppression seems to have changed and transformed over time. Yet as someone who has written extensively about race and its political and moral implications, what do you make of Black Lives Matter? And what do you make of the general sort of atmosphere in terms of the social movements and protests that are occurring today in the States over the incredibly unjust death of George Floyd? Well, I think it's extremely um, interesting how this one event has somehow finally sort of shifted the mood and uh, crystallized because uh, just to you know uh, give us give our sense of, ourselves a sense of the background um, about uh, uh, well say last year about a thousand people were shot to death by the American police and about a quarter of them were were African American in a country where the African American population is about 30 something like that 30 percent. So uh, you're about twice as likely to be shot by the police uh, if you're black as if you're uh, white. Um, slightly more than that because of course some of the other people who are shot are uh, minorities too and they are also shot at a rate disproportionate to their numbers in the population. So, um, so you know, you could have, th this sort of thing happens from time to time and because of the uh, widespread distribution now of video recording, uh, it's recorded quite often now. And so we've had these episodes off and on over the last few years. Um, and Black Lives Matter, you know, has been keeping track of them over the last few years and, and has been drawing them to people's attention. So there's an interesting question about why now. I think uh, one reason, of course, is that we're in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, millions of people are out of work. Uh, lots of people are locked down at home and they have more time to pay attention to these things and think about these things, they're less busy, many people, than they would ordinarily be. Another thing I think is that um, people have been um, energized by the recognition that at the center of all this, in the American White House, in the presidency, there is someone who seems completely incapable of responding in a decent way to episodes of this kind. And um, so the sense of a kind of moral vacuum at the, at the heart of national life, I think, is also a part of it. But there has been a shift going on over the last few years, uh, actually, particularly since President Trump was elected, uh, among the, in, in the ashes of white people. Um, so now, uh, uh, many, many more, I mean, uh, very much, uh, certainly more than a majority now, and mm. probably more than 60% of, of white Americans think uh, that there's something wrong uh, with the way in which African Americans are treated by the police. Of course, uh, African Americans have thought that all along. Um, and again, just to give you some background numbers, 50% um, of African Americans, if you do a national poll, uh, will say that they've had a bad interaction with the police, and the comparable number for white people is 3%. So, um, so again, I think it's, it's important that there has been this shift though the problem is by no means new. More than that, I think the shift isn't, rightly, isn't just about um, uh, these, these deaths. Uh, we have to remember that the police officer who killed uh, Mr. Floyd almost certainly didn't mean to kill him. He wasn't deliberately carrying out a murder on, uh, on video. Uh, what he was doing, though, was uh, subjecting him to degrading treatment in front of other people in part in order, I think, to signal that he thought it was okay to treat black people that way. And his audience mostly consisted of black people. And the, and the young woman who bravely took the, the film that we've mostly seen uh, was an African-American woman. So he was part, I think it was signaling. It was actually meaning to say what we took it to mean, which is uh, you don't matter in the way that other people matter. I'm, I'm the boss here. and. Um, and that means that it's not just about people being killed, it's about people being treated 
uh, without the appropriate level of respect, uh, uh, not treating them as bearers of human dignity. And that uh, is, of course, not a matter of uh, two, three hundred people a year. That's millions of people having these bad interactions. And, uh, and that's obviously unacceptable, too. So I think uh, I'd say that's the context in which I place all this. Uh, the, the combination of the pandemic, which mm. has sort of given people focus, uh, and with the, with the moral vacuum in the White House, and then this particularly blatant episode of um, the imposition of indignity on someone. Quite. And on that note, actually, because you mentioned both, um, I think there are two interesting observations you make. The first is on the structurality of a lot of the injustices we're talking about here, that they are sort of attitudes, bigoted attitudes that permeate throughout the policing structures and whatnot. And that almost is reminiscent of, uh, to some extent, a banality of evil, where you might not be a racist yourself, but you reckon that this is your job and therefore you're complying merely with orders. The second observation, I suppose, is in terms of the White House. Now, some have suggested that the violence adopted by the protesters in this case, uh, by Black Lives Matter or certain segments of them, is warranted in a response to Trump's epithet and also Trump's uh, complicitness, really, in all of this wrongdoing. Whereas others have said that violence crosses moral baselines and that ought not be tolerated. What do you make of the role of violence in activism in America today, Professor? Well. Um, I think that the main, the first thing to stress is how incredibly peaceful these large demonstrations have mostly been. The violence uh, has been pretty uh, modest. And, uh, and if we're going to talk about violence, we should probably talk about police riots as well, because the police have gotten out of control in a number of places and done things like in Minneapolis, going around slashing the tires of cars that were around, uh, including in parking lots. So, um, so, and that, just to be clear, I mean, that's not justified either. Um, the level, I mean, I think that uh, historically, uh, and this is a topic that's been studied by political scientists, um, the effect of uh, violent uh, demonstrations has mostly been, I think, to, um, uh, well, uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's not terribly effective. Uh, what's effective is large-scale uh, uh, peaceful demonstrations. Um, some of the violence is done by people who are indignant, and it's violence against property uh, or against the police. And that's expressive of uh, indignation about the, the topic that the protests are about. Some of it is just uh, what happens on the edge of any uh, disorder, which is the uh, uh, people who want to steal things or so on, or, you know, break windows and take televisions out of, out of stores. And, and that's obviously uh, neither helpful nor justified. But I think that um, when people, when there's a massive injustice and people are indignant, it's not surprising if they uh, exercise uh, violence against property mm -hmm. or against the officials of the state uh, against whom they're protesting. I'm, I mean, I'm basically not an enthusiast for violence. And, I, and as I say, I'm not sure that I think it's terribly effective mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as a mode of expression, but it's at least intelligible. And, um, and as I say, I, I would say the main thing to focus on, in fact, is just how we've had these very large demonstrations and mostly they've been peaceful and often when they haven't been peaceful it's the fault of the police mm. so um but you know uh, one has to uh if you're i mean my basic view is that uh, you know, violence against persons and property is, is bad um if you're going to however make that criticism which i'm inclined to do you've got to also yeah. bear in mind what it's about what's what it's expressing and to the extent that what it's expressing is legitimate indignation about injustices, it seems to me a kind of uh, not, um, I mean, it's, that's, that's, that mitigates the offense, as it were. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, as I say, my, my fundamental view is that uh, violent, political violence is, is a bad idea. 
uh, but uh, I mean, because it's because it's mostly because it causes harms that mm -hmm. are not necessary and and and, uh, and it isn't very effective. But um, but I think you've got to interpret it uh, as it were fairly, and in the context of, of the indignation being expressed, it's actually impressive how little violence has mm -hmm. been. And on that, following from that, because I think that's really interesting, because from your response, we can tease out, I guess, a few senses of sort of the normative critiques or labels you can attach to violence. One variant is on permissibility. So the correlated claim is that you have a right to violence. You, have, you might have liberty, might have a claim right even to violence. Who knows what that means? But another set of language is in terms of understandability or intelligibility mm. of violence as both an interpretive phenomenon but also perhaps even as a quasi-normative phenomenon. And one sort of residual doubt I've always had towards philosophers that theorize about violence, I guess um, Hannah Arendt is the, the prime example there, is there's often a conflation between justifiability of violence, permissibility of violence, and intelligibility of violence. And you bring all three senses together, couple that with some instrumentalist conception of what is right and say, it doesn't work. And, and to be clear, I also think that violence doesn't work in some cases, in some others it does. And I actually think that instrumentally speaking, the consequentialist litmus test does play a pretty important role in assessing whether or not violence is right. But it just strikes me that as philosophers thinking about the real world out there, um, we might have a paucity of resources to some extent in describing and articulating the sort of right and wrong or decision, decisional moments that folks out there are confronted by, whether they be peaceful activists or violent looters. I'm not saying we should sympathize with the latter, but I'm just observing, I don't know if you have this feeling, Professor, that we might not have the vocab or even the knowledge to really make sense of what's happening there. Is that a feeling that you also have? Well, I think so. I mean, on the, on the instrumental question, it's, it's, I don't mean to say that it's never the case that violence is uh, uh, politically effective. Um, the, the storming of the Bastille was politically effective. Uh, that was violence. Uh, and the, uh, the Chinese Revolution and the Russian Revolution involved violence, and they were effective in, in capturing the state eventually. So um, uh, I just think that uh, if you're engaged in this kind of expressive violence, in the United States, you have to look at the evidence about how the political system responds to it. And um, I do think that, uh, for example, the riots, uh, and they were riots after the death, uh, after the assassination of Martin Luther King, um, did really, as it were, draw to people's attention the, the sense of outrage, uh, which of course many people shared. I mean, uh, assassinations are not popular, even of unpopular people. And some people didn't like Dr. King, but hardly anybody thought it was appropriate to, to, to kill him, to shoot yeah. him. So, um, and, and, and that did produce response. Uh, it didn't produce a very effective long-term response. I mean, mm -hmm. the Kerner Commission report, which was done after, those, after the political violence in the 60s, uh, made a lot of recommendations. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that, you know, here we are. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and we are facing, if you read the, if you read the Kerner report, uh, we are facing a situation very similar to the one yeah. that they described. So, so um, I don't mean to, but you're right, that we need to very much to distinguish between the question of uh, understanding what the violence mm. says and what it means and understanding the temptation to violence and why some people will be uh, unable to resist that temptation. Yeah. Uh, from the question of whether it's um, either effective, which is the second question, or the question of whether it's permissible, which is the third question, or as you suggest, whether people sometimes have a right to violence. So clearly, uh, for example, uh, in the context of a protest where police behavior is out of control, um, some violence is warranted because it's in self-defense. And, uh, and generally speaking, you have a right to self-defense in those mm -hmm. contexts if the person attacking you isn't entitled to be attacking you. Right. So, um, so, so I mean, all of those things would have to play a role in thinking about any particular act mm. of violence. Uh, do we need more distinctions? Um, well, I, I think uh, th th it's important to distinguish, uh, obviously, but, well, perhaps it's not obvious, but, it, but I think it's important to distinguish between violence that uh, damages property and violence that damages persons, yes. uh, even even uh, bad persons, um, seems to me uh, that's much more serious and 
creates mm. much more uh, substantial uh, reasons to, to uh, justify it. Again, I think self-defense is such a reason sometimes, uh, though self-defense too has to be uh, proportionate. Yeah. So um, I think we have, you know, th those are sort of the main <laughs> uh, areas of, of normative uh, reflection that I think are, are a consideration that I think are relevant um, in, de in deciding something like that. That's fair. Although I think, I guess, a slight quibble I might have concerning the self-defense argument is that I, I don't know if you're familiar with sort of the, the works like of, of, say, Jeff McMahon, who writes on, say, uh, the, the permissibility yes. of yes. harming the innocent, uh, well, the innocent pedestrian or the innocent passerby. And I guess there's some interesting question there about the extent to which, beyond proportionality, there might be another principle that sort of fixes or constrains uh, the principle of self-defense. But moving on, just want to segue. Right. So just to be clear, I, I, I was thinking of self-defense where the person you're defending yourself yeah. from is the person attacking you. Right, uh, yeah. But, but, but it's true that, again, that there can be um, what in military context would be called collateral damage. Exactly. And um, I actually um, think that uh, it's better in the context of warfare, which is what mm. Jeff has, has mostly written about, yeah. um, uh, to, I think I prefer an analysis that derives from sort of the laws of war and traditions of war from one that's so completely guided by considerations that are supposed to be uh, apt, uh, both in the context of warfare and not. I, 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 uh, I mean, in general, uh, again, um, <laughs> uh, I don't believe that wars are starting a war is is, mm. is justified usually. Um, though again, there can be, there must be, I think, exceptions. I'm not a complete pacifist, but um, but I think that um, the circumstances of war are, are, are create special moral considerations, right. uh, and in particular. Um, uh, I, I think that in general, um, we need to modify our understanding of the laws of war to um, take, because of the character of modern warfare, uh, to give more weight to avoiding um, yeah. collateral damage than the practice of most modern armies allows. So would you say that, because that almost seems to come across as a bit of a Walzerian slash uh, spheres yeah I, mean, I, I think i think right. that uh you know the, the um in in, <laughs> in moral life uh, uh custom uh, plays a role in 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 part because custom gives us um predictable responses to coordination problems uh which could be solved in other ways in other words with a different custom um, so I, I do think customs, uh, now the, of course customs can be wrong, the customary mm -hmm. treatment of African Americans is wrong, and so we need to abolish and abandon those customs, but, um, but I think the custom, so, so I like Waltz's yeah. notion that, that uh, I, mean, I, you know, I don't agree with all the details, but, but I like Waltz's notion that, uh, that really we need to attend to the, uh, the traditions that we have for thinking about these things, modify them where they're are serious moral objections to them, but not abandon them entirely or replace them um, wholesale with kind of um, top-down, a priori derived <laughs> substitutes. That, that makes sense. I mean, for, for one thing, you know, th this is a, 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 an argument in defense of the common law, which, which, which operates both in this country and in Hong Kong, where you are. Um, at least it used to until recently. <laughs> it's unclear what law operates in Hong Kong right now. Um, the, um, uh, the, I mean, the common law develops as a kind of social response to problems, and it, and people, judges in particular, uh, lawmakers have to think about problems and develop solutions to them. And uh, there's there's a wisdom mm. in that in that practice sometimes. So that that's what I had in mind. That, that's interesting because I guess a, a slight sort of looping back to what you said, Justin, about the movement and also the protests right now. I suppose another way of looking at the customs of activism, so to speak, is to perhaps argue that you can stretch the sphere of 
Waratahib ethics and apply that to what's going on in terms of A, civil disobedience and B, sort of social movements and protests and contentious politics. Mm -hmm. And I, I think this is something that, say, Candace Delmas has tried to do with her discussion of sort of uncivil civil disobedience. And I guess they're also realists that work along or within that particular tradition. But just want to move on, I guess, to another aspect of our call today, because um, I've read both your excellent work, The Lies That Bind, and also Francis Fukuyama's Identity. And I'm sympathetic to a lot of your criticisms about identity politics and this fixation over fixed identity categories in particular. But my pushback here, also based on what we said just then about norms and rituals is, Professor, I think sometimes identities, particularly those that we take and socially are defined as immutable. So suppose our, that that's our race, or maybe that's our, in, in some cases, sex, even though increasingly gender is emancipated from that rigid conceptualization. Uh, such identities often provide us with a sense of anchor precisely because we think of it as not just immutable, but also as domineering, as the hegemonic identity category that we feel that we can identify ourselves at. And that's you know, what binds us to others that look like us in our in-group, and indeed it otherizes others, but in the process of doing so, it enables us to feel that we belong somewhere. So it's parsimonious, but I think it's also incomplete, and as you pointed out, quite a flawed construct in many ways to believe in one fixed identity category. But do you think there's at least some value in embracing, even prioritizing at least some sort of fixed identity categories, even in spite of your writings and arguments there? Or do you still stand quite firmly that identity, even of that nature, still brings more harms than good and therefore should well, be uh, So um, I don't think of myself as uh, having argued that, uh, that, as it were, identities are always, uh, appeals to identity are always bad. Um, in fact, as far back as um, uh, 19, uh, let's see, 1990, 91, uh, I argued in, in a book called In My Father's House that there was a place for, um, say, Pan-African, Pan-Africanism as a source, as a kind of uh, way of, as, of, for Africa as a, as a political identity, even though the history of Pan-Africanism is extremely essentialist about, um, about as it were, the Negro, about what it is to be. Af and in particular, it's also um, racialist. And so, uh, not very apt for a continent that contains uh, large numbers of uh, Maghrebi Arabs who are not uh, yeah. Negroes in the traditional conception, and, and of course significant numbers of descendants of white settlers who, who are now uh, citizens uh, of, of uh, African countries. But, um, so I'm not, uh, and furthermore, I don't want to be the kind of intellectual that fusses about intellectual details when the concept is, is being mobilized to do good and useful things. Um, uh, I, in a book of mine you didn't mention, uh, as if, I, I argue for the role of uh, idealization and simplification mm. and, uh, and crude models uh, being useful sometimes. So um, I'm not against uh, appeals to identity, but I think we can combine recognizing their utility with recognizing the ways in which these um, the oversimplification can, in certain contexts, be counterproductive. And uh, that's, I think that's evidently true in the case of race. I mean, what, one of the things about Pan-Africanism, one of the problems about the racialist uh, base of Pan-Africanism is that it has led people to assume that because it's a movement of, of, of black people, um, there's no work to be done in generating solidarity, that the solidarity is automatic. But it's but you know racial groups are incredibly diverse and solidarity is extremely hard to maintain when people are living uh, through very different uh, moral notions, uh, living through very different traditions. So um, that's an example of a case where where pointing out the um, challenges posed by a kind of rigid essentialist conception of identity is helpful to the cause itself. It makes it makes it strengthens the cause to say let's be more. That's, so that's that's sort of my view, and um, you know I, I, the same. I think I have the same view about um, about uh, about gender categories. Uh, you know, as they develop in response to perfectly reasonable critiques from feminism and from the trans movement, um, they become more useful and more usable for more people. This seems to be a good thing. 
uh, I don't want to abandon gender. I actually like being a man, uh, a cis man. But, um, uh, and I find it useful. It simplifies my life in the, in the, in when I'm shopping. So <laughs> there, are many, there are many aspects of identity that yeah. are useful. So, so I don't mean to be an en enemy of identity. It, it, in, in the book, The Ethics of Identity, I quoted um, Carlyle's response to Margaret Fuller, who said about, who said, I accept the universe. And uh, Carlyle said, Gad, she better. Uh, well, uh, you know, I, I accept identity, Gad, I better, because I think uh, the, the idea of imagining an intelligible social world without it is, is very challenging. So I don't think it makes sense. I think human life without social identities, especially because we now live on a scale which yeah. requires regular interaction with strangers, uh, would be impossible. That's eminently reasonable, although I, I guess I just want to share with you, I guess, an uneasiness I have with respect to the way identity theory has evolved. And I think there's a creative, possible, possibly destructive tension between two forces here. And one of the forces is sort of the deconstructionist slash reductionist approach to identity, where, say, Butler's analyzed the way uh, sex and gender are performed, and that's echoed by a lot of disability theorists who examine sex through the lenses as uh, or similar lenses as they examine disability and a con socially constitutive element there. Uh, and then on the other hand, there's also what you pointed out just then, a view that you know, identity categories are useful, are utile, and help us you know, navigate the complex moral quagmires that we, we face every day. And yet, I think one of the criticisms that have been levied towards Butler, and in my opinion, perhaps slightly unfairly, is just the view that a lot of trans individuals, or indeed folks who hold very strong identification with respect to their own genders, feel that their genders are innate, that they're born this way, that these are you know, naturally constitutive parts of whom they are. And that therefore, it seems almost that to characterize such strong feelings of self-identification as instrumentally useful as potential moral fictions or as some sort of you know, products of performance and rituals and internalization of these rituals almost seems to demean uh, that self-identification. Now, I don't know if this is a tension I'm just making up, but I, I do think that this is a question that queer theorists might have to reckon with as increasingly both performativity and the importance of identitarian or self-identification, um, both of these forces come to the forefront of this creative tussle. Right. So I think that if what you're up to is the philosophical task, then um, you should worry first about what's true <laughs> about these things. And it, it just seems to me that, uh, I don't agree with everything Judy says about, uh, about the performativity of, of, uh, of gender, but, um, but I'm basically on, on that side. I, I think, uh, and of course here, I think it's important to insist that identities are themselves very various yeah. and that the, the substrate with which they work uh, is uh, different depending on uh, what the identity is. I, I, one of the problems I think with the notion of disability is that it's bringing together everything from people who have uh, severe, uh, who suffer from severe uh, diseases, uh, diseases that are disabling, uh, people who suffer from congenital uh, uh, properties that are um, that, are, uh, that limit what they can do by comparison to what other people yeah. can do uh, with uh, people who are um, congenitally uh, deaf, for example, who in a decent society with a decent number of people speaking uh, uh, signing American Sign Language or, or appropriate sign language uh, are really not terribly disabled at all in the sense of uh, made unable to do uh, most of the things that they want to do. Their, their deafness is, as it were, constitutive of who they are, and it's not, mm -hmm. not really exactly a limitation at all. So I think, um, uh, and, and well, final point, um, most of us, if we're lucky, will end up in this category because at the end of our lives, all of us will have uh, limitations set by our physical bodies mm -hmm. or our cognitive capacities uh, that uh, will make it less easy for us to do things that we once did more easily. So, um, so I think, uh, you know, the identities vary. Um, so in the case of the sexual body, for the vast majority of people, perhaps, 
I don't know, 95% of people, um, the, their sexual body uh, is pretty clearly and determinately, uh, uh, unless they choose to alter it, uh, uh, masculine or feminine. They either have uh, the, sec the primary and secondary sexual characteristics of a man or the primary and secondary char sexual characteristics of a woman. And that, uh, it's, it's on that substrate, as it were, that gender gets built. So there's something there. It's not imaginary. Uh, similarly, um, um, the typical African American is actually darker skinned than, than most other Americans, and that's a fact of biology. And on that fact is then built, as it were, the superstructure of racial identities in ways that have almost, uh, be because skin color is not a terribly important feature of people, uh, either biologically or in any other way, Mm. Um, have a kind of arbitrariness to them, but still it's grounded in something. So, um, so I think where, so we need to understand the grounding, right. understand what it is, uh, that the thing that the identity in question is based on, um, you know, nationality is a very important kind of identity. That's, that's based mostly on legal questions and questions of, uh, citizenship law. Um, and those are entirely artifactual. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so I, I think we we need to, uh, as, philosophically speaking, we need to understand what the substrates are, if there are any, and how they work. Uh, whether um, people who are uh, who, who experience limitation on the basis of an identity, um, like trans people, uh, face limitation on the basis of existing conceptions of gender, whether their understanding of what's causing the problem is correct is uh, not a question that's to be decided simply by uh, conceding immediately to them any claim they make. For one thing, they make different claims. And so you, you, can't, uh, you can't make it constitutive of what it is to be the truth about trans matters that uh, the trans people get to decide because trans mm -hmm. people don't agree with each other. And anyway, even if they did all agree, there would be facts of the matter about the social processes that produce the identities. So of course you should be respectful to people's feelings about these things and courteous and, and you mm. shouldn't you know bang them over the head but i don't think we can back off from what we think is the best analysis on right. the grounds that the, the, that the people now that doesn't mean as i said earlier that we should be in the business of banging on about the correct analysis in the context where what's really important is um making progress uh, on on the issues that the movement has raised so, so that's interesting because I think from your response, I can tease out, I guess, three senses again where we can analyze identity categories like uh, gender and also six uh, or not, well, gender and race to start with. And the first is sort of the genesis. So how are these identity categories formed and causally you know, engendered by society or otherwise? The second question is the ontological, which is the existential question. What is gender? What is a race? Or is it a natural kind or not? And the third is a normative question. And I think, Professor, you, you distinguished and differentiated between the first two and the, le uh, the third uh, and suggested that normative question, in respect to whatever you think about the ontology slash genesis, should be answered separately, and that's fine. Although I guess a pushback I now have is, I don't know if you're sort of familiar with the literature and say moral risk. I'm sure you, you, you yourself have worked a lot in sort of probabilities and hermeneutics mm. linguistics there. But I guess an increasing school of thought is if on subjects like gender or race, or actually in, in a particular paper I read, it's on abortion, there might be indeterministic about the normative premises. So effectively there's a degree, or there's a chance that we might be wrong about a normative analysis, or, or not even normative analysis, but just in this case, the ontological premise about what sex and gender is. And if we want to sort of, given the risk there, make a judgment as to which of these variants we subscribe to, because of the innate epistemic risk here, we might have to default to normative metrics about what is right or wrong? Because when we're choosing between two options that may have roughly the same probabilities of being right or wrong, or, or maybe even in this case, there might be a slight probability of say 10% that this normative or this ontological interpretation, sorry, not normative is correct. And there's 90% chance that the other interpretation is correct. We have to make a value judgment. And those who are obviously Bayesian or say aggregative instrumentalists might say, ah, oh, let's opt for the most probabilistically likely answer. But that seems to me a normative question. That seems to me a normative decision, because if you're saying that I believe that my 
the correct diagnosis or the, the correct diagnosis is one that is more reflective of reality is the right one. Rightness there embeds within it some degree of normativity. So all of this is, sorry for the long windedness, is just to say yeah. that there might be some degree of normative indeterminacy that's smuggled within or into that ontological question that we can't run away from. And that's why also, I guess, from my point of view, I'm more sympathetic towards the letting those with credible epistemic authority decide. But then how do you handle dissent then amongst those peers is an entirely separate matter that I don't think I have the resources to articulate or capture. Well, good. So, I mean, there's some good points there. Um, let's, um, let's just say this. The, uh, uh, You, you could, uh, I mean, the, what is, when we say the ontological question, we're, we're in effect asking what we should say and think uh, about uh, one of these categories yeah. in terms of uh, uh, what the right account is of its, uh, uh, its place in, in, in the world. Um, now, but that's essentially, in the end, the semantic question. It's a question mm. about the relationship between a representation and the world. And you could reasonably say, I think, that um, semantic questions are not determinate. In, uh, they're the result of, uh, they're partly the result of con conventions uh, which should be, which are contestable. Uh, and so you could say, and some people have said, I think Sally Haslanger thinks something like this, that there's a contest here over what we shall make what we shall use the word race to do. Yeah. And there isn't a fact of the matter antecedently of what it's correct to use the word race to do. We have to decide what to do with it. And if the way we've been talking has been doing damage, uh, as it has in the case of race, uh, through racism, uh, then we have, uh, we have to decide. And then there are various options. One option uh, is to abandon the term altogether. One option is the uh, anti, as it were, which, which turns into, ontologically speaking, anti-realism, to the view that the thing isn't real. Um, but I think that's better understood, as I say, not as a, really as a, as a claim about the world. In my second book, which was about Michael Dummett's anti-realism, I, I, um, I, I, I sort of came to the view that uh, these ontological questions are always really uh, questions not about reality, yeah. but about the relationship between representations and reality. And, and here I was disagreeing with someone like Michael Devitt, who, think, who thinks yeah. the opposite. Um, I continue to think that, though I haven't worked on that question for a while. Um, and therefore, I think that there's always space for a normative uh, consideration, because what you're talking about is uh, uh, what shall we, how shall we use language? What mm. shall we use it to do? And that's 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 a question that has normative uh, uh, weight. So um, so I wouldn't see this in terms of the moral risk problem, because that's that picture supposes that there's an antecedently correct answer, and we're trying to gauge the proper epistemic uh, probabilities for. Uh, for various possible answers. I would say, no, it's much more fundamental than that. Questions mm. about language are always, in the end, questions about how we shall speak. And those questions always have normative, uh, uh, potentially normative um, Quite. inputs. So on the other hand, <laughs> uh, you, you can't be Humpty Dumpty. You can't just say, uh, you know, whatever it is, uh, by something or other, I mean a nice top-down argument. Um, you've got to uh, be responsive to the fact, and this is relevant to the, the last part of your question, yeah. you've got to be responsive to the fact that the question you're asking is not about what I should do or what you should do. It's mm. about what we should do. Mm -hmm. And um, in the case of gender, we all have genders, not just cis people and not just trans people, mm. not just men and not just women and not just people who don't identify with either. And so uh, the system as a whole has to belong to all of us. And it, because it's a system, I can't, as it were, let you run one little part of it and, and claim another little part of it for myself. Uh, the notion of woman that uh, trans women are using is the notion of 
woman that cis women are using. And so they have to negotiate with one another about how to use the term woman, uh, as do men, because men use the concept woman uh, in order to respond to uh, women, but also, of course, to uh, think about what they are not. That, that's fair. And I, I want to segue into the final part of our interview today, but okay. because of the interesting nature of the, because what you said is so interesting, I guess, it really struck a chord with me to some extent, although I'm reminded of, say, standpoint epistemologists who might push back against your, the negotiation claim in that they might note that the negotiation process is innately plagued by power asymmetries and therefore cis-hit women's imagination of gender may not and intrinsically be a fundamentally diametrically opposed to that of someone who's a, a trans woman, even though there's perhaps greater validity in a letter's understanding with respect to policies that guide the letter. But that, that's for another day, I suppose. I just want to close off with a pretty um, light-hearted question, I suppose, which is, what do you think is the strongest argument in favour of anti-cosmopolitanism, given your, your work on cosmopolitanism? Just to play devil's advocate there. Um, and, and how would you approach well, to defeat the argument? So... There is uh, a, a, an experience and a form of life you can have in a uh, particularly a small closed community of people who are committed to one another uh, in a way that means that exit isn't one of the options they consider. Mm. There is, there is, uh, there can be something attractive about that form of life. Uh, it's why. Um, some people stay in the Amish villages 50 miles from here in Pennsylvania, uh, where they live uh, a sort of 18th century life. They don't have cars, they don't have telephones, they don't use money, uh, they, they don't have cell phones uh, or televisions. And, mm -hmm. um, but they live in communities of people who have a very deep sense of shared understanding. They, are, they worship together daily and weekly. And... Um, I completely see that that might be an attractive form of life. Um, I spent a certain amount of my childhood in a village of a few hundred people in England where my mother was born. I mean, she was born in that village. And it's now lost uh, the world that she grew up in. Uh, there, most of the large houses in the village are now occupied by people who come for the weekend only. <laughs> uh, and and many of the people who live there have to go elsewhere to work. When my mother was a child, people worked in the village. They, uh, they lived there mostly and so on. Um, so uh, I completely understand the appeal of that form of life. And I have respect for it. And um, if that's what people choose and if the children they raise in it uh, are raised with a decent understanding uh, of, of the world and choose to stay with it. I have no problem with that. I, I once wrote about this in terms of, of a notion of the, what I called the comforts of home. Yeah. There is a comforts of home dimension to this, which isn't there for the, uh, the person who's, who's less rooted. Um, I, I don't have, I mean, I feel at home in that village, even though I don't know anybody there anymore, I would feel at home there. I feel at home on the street in Kumasi in Ghana, where I grew up. Uh, and I feel home here in New York and in New Jersey, where I now am. But I don't, I'm not rooted in those places in the way that someone could be in, in a place like uh, one of these uh, Amish villages in Pennsylvania. So I, I, I understand the appeal of that. And, um, and I don't believe that a cosmopolitan should insist that everybody be cosmopolitan. In a way, that would be uncosmopolitan. <laughs> What's right. cosmopolitan is recognizing that there are a great diversity of valuable forms of human life and that some of us, the cosmopolitans, are engaged with the project of exploring to the extent that's consistent with respect and uh, courtesy uh, the options that other people have developed. Um, my mother brought me up uh, reading Basho mm. uh, uh, in English. Neither of us speaks, spoke Japanese. Uh, and I found my poetic life uh, affected by this 17th century Japanese person. Yeah. Uh, that was uh, a Japanese person who used the Chinese script and followed an Indian religion. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm 
respectful of people making different choices. I, I think that we need cosmopolitans mm. to make the world work because it's an interconnected world, but we don't need everybody to be cosmopolitan. I'm also a Puritan cosmopolitan in a sense that I adhere quite strictly to Jerry Cohen's uh, luck egalitarianism, so that's probably the angle I'm coming from. But I guess um, just to be a more aggressive uh, advocate for cosmopolitanism um, than you might be in this convo, and just to close off our in interview, you know, I, I was wondering, you mentioned that some folks could be non-cosmopolitans and some folks are. But isn't a worry there that even in terms of the identity categories or the feeling of home or the anchor or the Amish community and all that, that some of these identities and some of these feelings of home are fundamentally engineered or constructed through non-consensual or non-autonomous processes. You're enrolled into a worldview. You're brought up like that. Your family, your parents raised you as such. You've never been exposed otherwise. And I don't just use this to denote or talk about the Amish communities. I think that would be quite bigoted and also a narrow minded. But I'm just using this to describe the fact that we're all fundamentally embedded within these incumbents that we don't choose or opt into. And for mm. me, I feel cosmopolitanism is a liberating force that liberates us from the shackles there. So I don't know what you make of this view, Professor. Well, so, uh, but the point is uh, that uh, whether your background is cosmopolitan or not, and mine certainly was, uh, so I was raised as a cosmopolitan, um, not surprisingly, having a, a, a European mother and an African father, it was difficult to do anything else. But um, uh, I'm uh, so, so nobody gets to pick <laughs> the way they're raised, uh, and the Amish are actually a good example here because they are deeply committed to that idea of consent. So. It, they actually insist that young people in their community leave and yeah. go and look and do what they call homespringen, jumping around, uh, before they come back and commit themselves. Now, you can say, and I'm sure John Stuart Mill would have said, that's like uh, saying that uh, you're allowed to go dating, but then when you marry, you must stick with it for the rest of your <laughs> life. And he was in favor of divorce. Uh, and so I think uh, exit must be uh, uh, possible. Uh, for a society to be a decent society. I mean, for, for a community of that sort to be a decent community. Um, but I don't think you can require them to make exit easy because part of the way their life works is that they make commitments to one another which make exit difficult. Uh, but if somebody wants to leave, yeah. uh, certainly our society, our, our laws, should make sure that they can uh, leave one of these enclosed societies, sub-societies, and, um, and we should make sure, and again, uh, as it happens in the case of the Amish, there is a, there is a, a United States uh, Supreme Court decision, uh, Wisconsin v. Yoda, which says that they are required to educate their children up to a certain age, uh, as all children in the United States are required, can be required by the state to be educated up to, and, the, and, and that means that, that, that uh, the state is entitled to uh, keep track of making sure that they're raised in a way that does make it possible for them to understand what they're doing when they commit themselves to staying, understand that it's a choice among yeah. alternatives. Um, so I, yes, I, I'm not in favor of, uh, you know, the, the way um, the, the way you become a, a Tibetan Buddhist monk is somebody dumps you up at the monastery when you're a child and then you basically, you know, that's it. Uh, I, I don't think that's, uh, I don't think that is permissible so there are it sets limits but I've just when I said uh, what, what, uh, what I mean is that there are people who don't want to exit and they understand in the modern world you can't not understand what exit is yeah it's not like being in a tribe up the Amazon uh, that hasn't seen any you know anybody outside the tribe for hundreds of years and doesn't know anything about anybody else nobody lives like that anymore so everybody does know that they're making it in, in some sense um, they have a choice. They may not have made a choice. They may just, any more than most of us, make a choice about our gender. Most of us uh, grow up as men or women, and, and there's no moment in which we say, okay, I'm endorsing that. We just, yeah. we don't question it. Some, of course, if you're trans, you discover that it doesn't work for you, and so you have to, you do have to, have to question it. And I, because of the trans movement, I think more and more of us are, are aware that of this choice that, 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 that we might have made and that we didn't. Yeah. 
that's fine. But all I'm saying is the equivalent of saying, provided the way you live your masculinity is respectful of the choices of other people, I don't think there's anything harm in wrong in choosing to be a man anymore. And I think there's anything wrong, therefore, in choosing to be Amish. Uh, but but yes, the, the the it's just that you, I think some of the writing on the right of exit um, it, it ignores the fact that uh, that some institutions only work yeah. if exit is difficult. Um, and that's, their value depends upon exit being difficult. But if someone feels strongly enough that they want to exit, uh, do that difficult thing, yeah. I think they have a right to do so. I'm, an, I'm a moral individualist in that sense. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a really wonderful conversation. Thank you so, so much for your time. Well, thank you for those excellent questions. I think our audience have learned a lot. So thank you, Professor. Uh, we'll probably be uploading this shortly. And then we'll okay. be sending you the link to the video. But thank you so much. And, good. Uh, Very good to talk to you. Bye.